How can we increase our faith? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 17. All right, so we got through some tough parables. In fact, there was a whole other explanation of the unworthy servant, the dishonest servant that I didn't cover, but I just watched a video about it by Bob Guzik, who is a commentary I look at when doing this podcast. And he was saying that basically, I think the idea is that this guy was settling all the debts because he knew he was in trouble. He wasn't going to run away with the money. That wasn't his plan to how he was going to provide for himself. In fact, what he was doing was cutting off some of his money that he would get for his work of managing the money. So we're going to cut those debts short. I mean, it is irresponsible because the man was owed twice as much in each of the case, the master. But the idea is I'm going to bring you this money. We're going to put it into action. But now these other people are going to think favorably of me. So when I go looking for a job because I can't dig ditches and I'm too whatever to bet, I'm too prideful to beg, these people will hire me because I gave them such a good deal. I thought that was interesting. But also bringing up to the point that God gives us skills and talents. We all have something we bring to it. This video from Bob Guzik was really interesting on that particular parable because he talks about If you're a doctor, you know how to analyze things for the best treatment of things. If you're a scientist, you know how to look at evidence. Each of us are given skills of what we can do and how we can use them shrewdly because look how shrewdly the regular world is. He brings up the idea that there are people in every corner of the earth that drinks Coke, but how many people at every end of the earth knows Jesus? It's just a good point. I wanted to bring it up. So we're going to continue on now with Luke 17. Luke is always looking at the kingship of God, and we are coming closer and closer to Jerusalem, which is going to be our end. And he's talking to his disciples, but we also know that whenever he speaks to his disciples, there's no secrets, right? When he says, I'm talking to the apostles or training his apostles, or he's talking to the disciples, people are listening all around because he'll quickly talk to them, and then turn around and talk to the Pharisees. So it's not like this is a closed room for those ears only. This is a very public ministry. So then he says to the disciples, that temptation to sin is going to come. It is always going to come, and we know it always comes. We think we're going to do the thing. Paul will eventually say, and we'll talk about it then, I know the thing I'm supposed to do, and I don't do it. But it's better when those temptations come, he says, if a millstone were hung around our neck. Again, extreme language, not something we should take into action, you know, and that guy was cast into the sea. It's nothing you can do. You're going to drown in your sins. And if you cause one of these little ones to sin, now you're even in more trouble. So pay attention. If your brother sins, rebuke him, tell him what he did. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you got to forgive him. That is the nature of it. And the reason we know is because God says we should be forgiving others as we hope God forgives us. If we were to do the same sin seven times in a day and say, I repent, again, repent means to turn around, think again. Do we want God to forgive us? Then why aren't we forgiving our brothers too? This is the important part. So God is giving us this type of love, forgiveness, mercy. We should be giving other people likewise. And note here, he is not saying ignore the sin. It's not a forgetting of sins. It is a forgiving of sins. So keep that in mind too. We're all brought before God with our sins. Not like the world who says, you just do whatever you want. You be you, boo-boo. Nope. God has called us into a certain action. and will be forgiven for it, but it's not what they call a cheap grace. It is repentance and turning back. One of the commentaries or a few of the commentaries mentioned that when we see the word little ones and we think of children, so if we cause one of these children to sin, which I think is very extreme because again, if you do that, you're in trouble. But he also meaning young Christians, people who are new to this, new to this faith because we go directly into sinners. So it's not just, according to the commentaries, a child. It is also a a new Christian. And again, Luke is talking to brand new Christians. It's important that we don't cause other people to sin. We pray to God, lead us not into temptation. 
we should not be leading people into temptation. That is not our job. And again, as always, many numbers in the Bible are sort of representative of numbers. And so if he says seven, we say, well, yeah, dead number eight now, and now I'm not going to forgive you. If we sinned eight times, we would still hope God forgives us as well. It just means that we don't take it lightly, but we also don't withhold our forgiveness. So the apostles, one of the 12, said to him, increase our faith. I'm sure they just, you know, they know the importance of being with Jesus. I think, again, another fantastic question from the apostles. And he brings up what we've heard before. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, a grain of it, you could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and plant into the sea and it would throw itself in. We've seen mountains throwing themselves into the ocean with a faith of a mustard seed. Just a little bit of faith can accomplish many things. Can't even see it because it's so tiny. And the question is, is what are we doing with our faith to do big things for God? The importance of the mulberry tree is that it was considered the mulberry trees had very, very strong roots and that the trees would last a very long time. So it wasn't something like a little weed in your backyard, a little dandelion, and go throw it into the ocean. This is a big deal, like the mountain throwing itself into the sea. This is a very deeply rooted tree ripping itself out and going into the sea. Certainly in Luke, we have gotten into a very complicated series of parables. With the story structure in these parables, we can mull them over. If God were just to list an itemized bullet point of all the things, it'd be hard to memorize. But we can remember the parable of the unworthy servant. We can memorize the parable of the bad manager or the prodigal son. We, those stick in our brain and stories are easier for us to remember. The next point that we read is the story of the unworthy servants, which is meant to make sure that we don't get prideful about the things we do. That's the one thing we never want to do. Someone even said to me, they said, well, I'm glad your podcast on the Bible is going well and people are listening to it, but don't get prideful about it. And I thought, oh, goodness, the last thing I'm getting about this podcast is prideful. This is putting me in my seat because you realize the message of Jesus is so deep and it has such an economy with words that you don't, I don't think you can get prideful from doing this. But he said that the story generally is, is that if you have servants or people are plowing the sheep, taking care of the fields, are you going to say, hey, you know, come out and hang with me? No, he's going to say, you're my servant. Cook me dinner, dress properly, you know, get out of your farm clothes and serve me while I eat and drink. And then when you're done, you can eat and drink, too. And when all is said and done, I say, I'm an unworthy servant. I've only done what I've been asked to do. The expectation is we serve God. It's not that not only. Did I work my job? I took care of my family. I did all the things, but I also served you, God. You know, look how cool I am. That is not what we're supposed to be doing. Our using our skills and our talents for God's kingdom is the expectation. We shouldn't get prideful about it. We shouldn't look for special praise or anything about that. Ha ha, God, look at me. Look at all the things I did. Instead, we know we're servants of God and that we have done just what we've asked and probably in the midst of it have fallen short and need forgiveness of our unworthiness in that sense. No one should walk away feeling pride. And it's interesting, too, because I believe we're still talking to the apostles. He wants to make sure, and I'm sure he sees it in their future, this ability to get prideful. They were the 12 who were called out by God. They have been trained educated, stood up so that they can continue on this mission once he's gone. But the question is, are they going to feel like it's a privilege? Are they going to feel like it's their duty to serve God? Or are they going to start getting prideful about it? We were one of the 12. We did all these awesome things. You see, in the gospel, they don't pump themselves up. They are quite honestly telling the story of the gospel, putting it in the right place. And I think that opinion that we screwed up and God constantly forgave us, constantly instructed us, is part of that humility that the apostles got from serving Jesus and hearing this kind of message. So on the way to Jerusalem, they're going through Samaria and Galilee, 
and they run into 10 lepers. Now, again, lepers have to stay far away because this is a highly contagious disease. And as soon as you had leprosy, which was a number of skin disorders, some of them quite fatal, some of them quite gory, they're off in the distance and they're saying, Jesus, have mercy on us. He sees them, says, go show yourself to the priests. And they were cleaned. One of them who was healed turns back and praises God in a loud voice and puts himself at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks. This was a Samaritan. This was the person who is considered bad by the people who were in Israel proper. Again, they could have been because of beliefs. It could have been because they were considered to be kind of half-breeds. You don't know where they came from. They turned their back on God living in this land that was resettled by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians. This was not the proper guy. Just the same thing with the Good Samaritan. You don't expect that. And Jesus asked the question, well, were there not 10 clean? Where are the other nine? You have turned back, this foreigner turned back to praise God and says, your faith has made you well. It always reminds me, I think, of the fact that We have to give thanks to God for everything that happens to us, for everything that he has given us mercy. I think for everything, everything. But I always remember that sometimes when I forget. So I get that I got a brand new job. I prayed about it very much. I wanted to get this new job. And suddenly I realized, did I thank God for it after I got it? I woohooed around the house. I told all my friends. I was excited about it. Oh, I don't want to be like the 10 lepers. I want to come back to God and thank him. I would love to tell you it was the first thought on my mind. I got there, but it took a while. It is the part of giving thanks and being grateful for what we have. So the Pharisees, as I mentioned, they're all around. Even though he's talking to his apostles, he's talking to his disciples. This is not a closed room. Everyone's hearing everything. And so when the Pharisees asked, when is the kingdom of God to come? You know, tell us about it. And Jesus like, It's not something that you're going to observe in that same way where you say, look over there, look over yonder. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you, meaning right here, right here, the kingdom of God. I am the kingdom of God. Some people said um, in you or within you, and people ran with that. that. The kingdom of God is inside of us. He was saying this to Pharisees, and the kingdom of God clearly wasn't inside of them because they were rejecting Jesus. In the midst of you, among you, that's the better translation. So then he turns to his disciples, of course, everyone's still listening, and said, there's going to become a day when you look for the Son of Man. Someday we're going to do a whole podcast about all the different names Jesus gives, but it's sort of a more mystical, uh, more ethereal name. It was used in various places in the Bible. You won't see it. And you'll say to yourself, look over there, look over here, and you'll try to go find it. And it'll be like flashes of lightning in the sky. That's what the Son of Man's going to be like. But first, the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Again, generation is a hard word. Do we mean the people right now? I mean, or we all, everyone from that time to this time, this last phase of biblical times, I guess, before the end, are we all going to reject him? It's a possibility, but we're going to reject him. He was rejected there. And he said it's going to be like in the days of Noah. It's going to be just like that for the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, and everyone was making fun of Noah because he's building this giant boat for whatever reason. And then the flood came and destroyed them all while Noah was in the ark. It's going to be the same thing. Or like Lot, everyone was drinking and eating and partying and buying and selling. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah was a happening place. And, but when it came time for Sodom to end, that fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed the entire town. You may not know this, but the whole surrounding area of the Sodom and Gomorrah, this is in towards the Dead Sea, is made up of sulfur. It's highly flammable. When that came and started to burn, the whole city was taken down. You weren't supposed to look back. You were just supposed to leave and go. And that's what Lot's wife did. She turned back. Don't do that. When the day when the Son of Man is revealed, and on that day, when anyone's on the housetop, thinking Noah, and you have all your good stuff in the house, 
but you are on the top of your house hoping that you're not going to die, you're going to survive this flood. There were people who are taken away like Noah and the people on the ark. They were removed from this problem. Just like all of us who are going into the fields, don't turn back. We saw that a couple of days ago in the parable that when you're plowing the field, you don't turn around. Then the quote, whoever tries to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. It's not worth saving these manly things. I saw this um, archaeological article this week, and it showed the richest burial site ever found. And it was this man, I think it was from Bulgaria or Belarus, started with a B, but his coffin was filled with gold and also bones. You know what? None of that went with him. So what? If he's the richest man in Bulgaria, none of that made it on to the next place. It's all sitting there in the ground, along with his earthly remains, saying, don't look to the things in your house, this physical body. You're going to lose your life, but you will keep it. He goes into talking about, and that night, which is the end to end, there's going to be two in a bed. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women grinding, and one will be taken, and one will be left. And the, one of the points that the commentaries made is that when you see the word taken, that there's two people in a field, and one is taken, and one is not. Some people believe in a rapture. Again, we're not going to talk about it right now. I'm going to be more prepared for it when we talk about it. They think it means more of taken in the sense of Noah and his family were taken to safety, that it was Lot's family, except for his wife, that was taken to safety. They just weren't ended at that point. Where the corpse is, that's the vultures. The predators will gather for it, just like that guy in Bulgaria. What ended up to happening to his body? It's not anything anymore. I'm not going to get into the rapture right now, and someday I will, but I will have to be prepared for that. So, but again, the vultures are there. When the final end comes, people are going to be divided, is the general gist of it. Just like the weed and the wheat, just like the wheat and the chaff, just like the goats and the sheep. <laughs> we have seen many times Jesus talk about at the very end a great separation. And that ends Luke 17. Boy, these uh, endings of the chapter really end with a bang, so to speak. But we'll again talk about that some other time. What I'm going to meditate on this week is that idea, always remembering that the things in my house, the house itself, even my bones, are nothing. That what matters the most is the soul that is connected to Jesus, the one that has accepted his gift because of the Holy Spirit and not rejecting him. The important part is the eternal, not the material. I'm going to certainly meditate about that. And what I'm going to pray about is the fact that when we get mercy, forgiveness, gifts from God, healing, we remember to be that one Samaritan leper who remembers to go back and thank God. I'm going to thank him for all the things that he has done that maybe I forgot about doing, or it just wasn't the most foremost thing in my mind. And what I'm going to share with others is this concept of gratitude. I see a lot of things said about gratitude. I'm going to keep a gratitude journal. And I'm sitting there thinking, who, who is it you're grateful to? Are you just writing all the things you're grateful for without a grateful to? Is there no sense that gifts are given to us by God? The thing I want other people to know is it's not just about being grateful and having a gratitude journal, but it's being grateful to God for all the many blessings we have. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I would love to hear about how this is going for you. Are you reading along? I hope you're reading along and what you're learning from these lessons. I would love to hear if this has had any sort of an impact on you or if there's something I could do to make this better. Mm -hmm.